And we're on. And we're live. Uh, guys, uh, we are back for episode, I believe it's episode 38 uh, almost in a row. 40 days. Al almost 40 days. Uh, and obviously to see out the weekend, obviously a very important weekend, at least for me anyway. Um, can I offer you a glass of wine? Yes. <laughs> yes. Truffle says yes. Uh, what would you like? What are you feeling? I'm feeling some Pinot. Are you feeling Pinot? Mm -hmm. I'm feeling Pinot. All right. Oh, who's going to be first on the comments today? Justin again. That is 13 days in a row. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to say Justin wins. Uh, you know, until someone else is 13 days in a row. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that is an unbreakable record. Uh, G'day Terry, Kerry, Yuko, Christina. Uh, new intro. Yes, it was a bit of a new intro. Um, I, I thought sort of carefully today. I had a little bit of spare time thinking about sort of how things are framed up. And um, uh, Laura was kind enough to buy us a new, uh, new camera that I've been eyeing off for the last year and of course if you know anything about cameras they can be really expensive um, or at least more expensive than, uh, than a couple of people uh, you know having a winery. Uh, I say the best way to waste a million is to start a winery or something like that. Um, but we thought we'd do something a little bit different today, Law. We thought, uh, well we, we thought, we thought to everyone, um, that we'd actually do Sunday, uh, you know, because it was something that, that was like a really common thing that sort of came about by, through um, a lot of the comments since Friday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it was my 30th, and I think a lot of people were really quite surprised to learn that we weren't 30 yet. I'm not going to say they surprised when we were young, because I, I think that's that's really quite ironic to say, but um, no, surprised to learn that, that we had, we had obviously we've got a winery, got, you know, obviously a brand that a lot of people know about, and we're trying to build a community, and we aren't actually you know, 30 yet. Um, and so I thought it would be really interesting to talk about sort of our, our view every Sunday because we're trying to reclaim our Sundays uh, to, to just, so it's just, it's always going to be us. Um, uh, but to talk about sort of us in business and how, how sort of, not how we got here, I'm sure you've heard more than enough about sort of how we got here, but maybe some of the things that we may perhaps struggle with, yeah. perhaps that we've learned, maybe, maybe you guys can offer us some advice as well. Um, but um, just talk about, you know, things, very, various things that we've either, you know, um, yeah, I guess, guess in general either struggled with or done really well with. But um, I don't know, first, first things first, Laura, cheers. Cheers. We made it through the weekend. Oh, we can <laughs> actually, cheers. <laughs> um, Sup Thomas, uh, thanks for chiming in. Supersonic Turtle O2, uh, new fancy graphics. We do have new fancy graphics. We've actually had those for a while. If you've, if you've jumped on our YouTube channel, you would, you would have seen them, but we, we thought we'd actually start to make this thing a little bit more professional. It became pretty, I guess, apparent to us about, you know, on Friday, wasn't it? That this is like quite a, like a thing now. Um, you know, we've legitimately built a, built a community. So we thought, you know what, let's actually see how far we can push this and, and make it a little bit more professional for you guys. Um, my turn for blind tasting is I wish me luck. Good luck, Terry. Good luck. Uh, it's not as easy as you might think it is. Uh, not sure if anyone's actually asked, but how are you and Laura going? I don't know. Oh, thanks, Zach. That's thanks, a nice Zach. question. It is a nice question. <laughs> how, are, how are you going? Uh, yeah, well, we're sort of, we've got through the, what I think of as the worst of it, um, in terms of, I guess, the impact of coronavirus to the business. So that, you know, there were a couple of weeks there where it was a lot of sleepless nights just uncertainty about how the government restrictions were going to affect our ability to be able to trade um, but we've got through the majority of that now which is great um, and means that we can um... <laughs> so no uh, someone just greg mcgill was like uh maybe you want to flip the camera around on instagram <laughs> thank you we've done that before too <laughs> uh and thank now you. yeah no, i mean now the business is operating in a completely different model i guess more direct to consumer stuff so it's just so in answer to your question going okay just a lot of thinking time and a lot of strategizing and trying to work out what we're going to do next which is um exhausting but also kind of uh, exciting and thrilling i feel like all the things that we've learned over the last seven years we're kind of putting into practice i think as well like like quite recently we've been um uh i, I guess sort of a, yeah, a lot of the books that you, and, and this is it, you know, we, we are trained, look, agriculturalist turned winemaker, viticulturalist, denologist turned marketer. Um, uh, and we've really sort of tried to in, um, uh, understand things like management theory, for example, how, you know, how do you manage people? How do you do all these other crazy things that business owners and CEOs do? Um, and none of them really apply to our industry because our industry works at a very, and it's odd, it's like our industry kind of works at a bit of a slow pace because we are, yeah. um, 
working with, with agriculture. With agriculture, we do our shit once a year. Um, and so it's eight mile. It's eight mile. <laughs> That's right. It's it's eight mile. Um, and so yeah, no, we've been. Like, mate, it was probably about two weeks worth of of sheer and utter terror. Um, and of course, within that period, we got to meet each and every one of you guys, um, and that made things so much easier for us. Um, it made things so get the routine for me personally, like having the routine um, of, of rocking up every single day. As much as it, I might say that it's a bit of a joke and I'm destroying my liver. And yeah, I mean, it's something that you know, drinking booze every night, and um, you know, it is something that that. Well, I'm mean, sorry, I kind of do it anyway. Um, but no, it's the routine's actually really, really, really good. Um, and when I like, I really do mean it. Last Friday, when we I got that really kind message from everyone uh, sending us their birthday messages. Uh, to realize that we were actually doing exactly what we kind of set out to do but didn't really think that we could do it uh, which is building a community in a period where uh, you know every every community building thing that you can possibly do relies on people being together and mm. you can't be together so how do you build a community and I, I grew up on forums and I'm, I'm a nerd um, so I, I grew up on uh, you know experiencing a sense of community but through a screen and I knew that could be done uh, you know, to be a facilitator of that, I'm just like stoked, just absolutely stoked. Um, so that made things a lot, uh, you know, a lot better. The fact that we have literally someone, thank you, Greg, chiming in, going, "Hey, um, you Instagram cameras." Yeah, and <laughs> from and this, I guess this is. Oh, the like when we went blackout the other day and yeah. everyone went to Insta and back again. I mean, that was just so this cool. This is the downside of only having the two of us here. We've gotten used to having other people watching these things. Well, normally it's me. I'm on the other side trying to make sure that everything is. Mm. Um, is working and you know fixing the camera and stuff. Yeah, and um, obviously facilitating all the, the blind tastings. Um, g'day, Sean. Thanks for chiming in. Uh, g'day, Dad. Jerry. Thanks for chiming in. It feels weird. Don't want to. It's my dad. Uh, Brendan, the Joe Rogan of wine. Oh yes, that's what I was thinking. Was happening the other day. Someone was like, oh, like what, what, what? How would you describe it? And someone said Wayne's World of Wine. I thought, the show, that, yeah. I think that's pretty accurate, but then someone said the jackass of wine and, um, you know, considering, <laughs> considering last night's antics and there's been a few of the episodes where the antics have gone above and beyond. Yeah. Um, yes, I, do, I think there is a degree of jackass, but Joe Rogan of wine, I think is really cool. And it's, I, I really want to do sort of podcasting, a few other things that kind of, if you want to nail me down in one place and isolate me, you better be prepared for some pretty wacko, crazy ideas to come out. Um, that's all I'll say. Um, what do you say to young people with big ambitions who don't necessarily have the vision or drive to start something like a winery just yet? Um, and this has come from Thomas Kennedy. Um, better now than never. Better now than never. Uh, and I think uh, if you've been watching uh, some of these, we had Ashley Ratcliffe on. And remember how he was like, oh, you know, I just, I knew I was going to look like a dickhead. But yeah, I yeah. just had to start. Yeah, and I that's just... never going to go away. Yeah, it's never going to go away. You, I, every time I, t I click that little, you know, start streaming button um, at literally five o'clock every night, um, the first thought that goes through my head is, uh, firstly, will Justin Hess uh, add to his record? Uh, <laughs> and secondly, um, I look like a complete idiot right now. And I'm sure we've had, you know, we're surrounded by windows as well. Like this is the Applewood cellar door, so we're surrounded by windows. We've had people literally just stand. Uh, and just stare and I'm like it would be good if you kind of like gave me an indication of why you're there but they just kind of like stand and stare and make me feel really self-conscious and stuff like that yeah. but uh, I think you get over it um, you know what I would say if you've got big ambitions then um, you you know you would starting a winery would be easy for you uh, you know that's the thing you know um, and if you don't have the drive to start a winery then you don't have big enough ambitions um, so it is a tit for tat you can't sort of have one and not the other um, mm. You know, my suggestion would be get prepared to look. I think this is the biggest thing that it's the fear. Uh, it's this all encompassing fear of looking like a tard. And, and it's politically correct, and I'm so sorry about using that word, but as politically correct as that sounds, that's just literally it. You need to get over yourself. Uh, and, you, and fortune favours the brave, uh, the people that put themselves out there. The second thing I would have to say, if you're going to be putting yourself out there, make sure it adds value to someone's life. Like, you can't just. If you put yourself out there and you're not actually adding value to anyone, then you are just an idiot. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, you're just a court jester and a complete idiot. Um, but if, if you're focusing on, on putting yourself out there because you believe that you can add value to someone's life, and that could be in what we're doing right now, entertainment and trying to service that, that point where if you're having to work from home and 
knocking off for the day, but you don't have that trigger, that turning off the lights at the office, that jumping in the car and, and going through traffic and rocking up at home really frustrated and having your other half say, do you want a glass of wine? How was your day? Like we don't. It have always that. goes like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Decompression straight away. <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, if you, you we don't really have the opportunity now because if you're working from home and you've both been working from home, then no one's really going to ask how your day was because they were there the whole day. Um, and, and it's the same sort of thing about like when you're at pubs. You know, you want to go and decompress with your mates, crack a couple of tinnies, and you know, I've got mine on the go here, yeah. lovely mangoes. Um, you know, and we just thought that we might be able to help everyone be be everyone's favourite drinking buddy, uh, or, and just be that that sort of trigger at the end of the day. That's like, hey, look, we're done. And and by the way, we know a shitload about wine. And if you had any questions about wine, we're going to introduce you to us and our mates and a bunch of other wines that you should totally be um, uh, you know be be uh, supporting and drinking. Uh, today, Australia Post is being super nice and delivered my second ice of Innovate on a Sunday. Yeah, I, For real? I fielded some inquiries for customers last weekend and they were definitely delivering on Saturdays. Um, so they must have extended that to Sundays now, which is, and they are, they have a massive backlog of orders, so I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that because I've been talking to, to our sort of, I guess, account rep, uh, mainly because it's one of those like squeaky gate uh, things, you know, the squeaky gate gets oiled first. Um, we've been very vocal with Ozpost in the last week. Yeah. Uh, Dreambird. 2018 Tempranillo Shiraz Matara, not a bad drop. Yeah. Um, uh, Tempranillo Shiraz Matara yeah. or Mavergera Matara, it's, you can use them interchangeably. Um, where's it from? Is it Barossa? Uh, question for Laura, can you talk about the pork in <laughs> wine skins recipe that was on Insta Stories the other week? Oh yeah, totally. Uh, so, a bit of a tradition here, but I first came across it when I was working in uh, Northern Rome, so Rome Valley. And at the end of vintage, we took the last pressings, um, the last red pressings, which would have been um, Shiraz, or Syrah, they call it there, uh, and cooked a, like, they did a whole pig. So, but like, all, like, cut up into um, different uh, chunks, I guess. Uh, and just cook it on a stove top in like a big commercial cooking thing with potatoes. Mm. Uh, for you know several several hours so it starts to kind of get really melty uh, and it the other pork all infuses with the um, the flavor of the skin so it's like marinating at the same time that it's being cooked and I um, I had it and we you know we had it for lunch and they actually serve it there with like a um, they've got appellated cheese in France mm. uh, so same way we have wine appellations they have appellation um, for cheese and where I was it was all goat's cheese uh, like amazing goat streets and they have something in uh, in France that's like it's before I don't even know I'm gonna have to ask when we get this cheese maker on what it is but it's not like the weighing curds and it's not final cheese yet it's something in between and it's kind of like a creme fraiche oh yeah right fromage, okay fromage fresh or something like something in between so it's still like a more like a yogurt but with the tartness of cheese that and sounds it's, really good it's, it's basically like cream cheese acidity of goat's cheese and that's what they served it with and also like freshly cut up herbs with this slow cooked pork and potatoes yeah uh, and it was awesome and i think it was um it's not like the most amazing dish i've ever had but it was the it was the spirit that it was the end of vintage it was three wineries had come together to be able to have this um this meal together and then I, I, I sat there and I asked everyone how, like, how do you make this? Because I'm going to make it when I get home. And I also, I thought I'd just be able to jump on the internet and be like, you know, pork stewed in great mark and find a recipe for it. But there's nothing. There is nothing yeah, yeah, on the internet. You can't find it at all. For this recipe. So no. I had to, um, I can't, we've just, over the last three years, we've tried to make it each time. And it's been like a balance of, you also need to add water and wine. Uh, and we've managed to work it out, we get better each year, and now it's our tradition, it's the last press of the, of the vintage we uh, make, and normally it's actually Nebbiolo, um, yeah. this year it was Merlot, Merlot. Which, and I think the Merlot worked better because it's got more of a strong flavour. Totally, and uh, probably because I put 25 litres of wine in the thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it was like really like marinate, and we cooked it for what, four, four or five hours? I think Maybe four or five hours it was, but uh, yeah, basically, um, and that was, that was only because the so last, last couple of years we've done it in sort of like our own little scam pan things, mm. you know, for the staff, but um, uh, about a year ago, we've been big into sort of recreating a lot of cultural dishes back at home, seeing what sort of Aussie interpretations we could do with them, and um, uh, during sort of two, two things that have come about. So the, the one that happens now, which is obviously that, that sort of pork dish, which was, uh, yeah, basically you grab a big ass pot, you just chuck a bunch of 
pressed grape mark, so it's grape skins and yeah. seeds and everything down at the bottom, put it out and you like put potatoes in, then more of that, then more potatoes and more of that stuff. And then you put like, it was like a pork shoulder and then more potatoes, more of that. It's sort of like, think of it like a lasagna. And then you, I just poured like, you know, a bucket of wine, like straight out of the tank, just bucket, bucket of wine and then cracked that baby on and then left that for like five hours and just added more wine as it started to reduce down because it, it started to, I've pretty much succeeded in killing the pot. I think I've destroyed the pot. I don't, if you guys have any really good tips on getting like an inch thick, layer of, of completely caramelized stuff off the bottom of a pot. I've tried boiling it off with like detergent and everything, it's terrible. Um, but we bought that pot because we were trying to uh, recreate, um, if you guys ever get the opportunity, it's one of the most amazing places to go to, it's uh, New Orleans uh, in, in Southern uh, America. And um, uh, they once a year have yabby season, or uh, crawfish, crawfish season. Um, and they, that you can go to any sort of like, I don't know, we went to, it was like a pub. Mm. It was what we would call a pub. Um, and for 20 bucks, you could get basically a pint of beer and like a polystyrene thing. And you basically, you just get given that. And you're like, what do I do with this? And they go oh, over there, they point you towards an esky. You open the esky, but it's not esky to keep it cold, just keep it hot. Yeah. Um, and they're just dumping in basically, um, well, yeah, what we would call yabbies. The crawfish, and and you would they're all like chili done. It's yeah, all done seasoned in like, with Cajun. Yeah, Cajun spices. Uh, and like corn and sausage and potatoes, and it's been cooked. Yeah, they make they focus on making this really amazing broth, and then quickly drop the yabbies in for I don't know. I mean, no, it's probably like only five minutes or so. Yeah, yeah. And then they they strain it off, and all of that flavor's been absorbed by the yabbies. It's pretty cool. It's basically like eating um, pistachios, but meat. Yeah. And uh, the only rule is you so you fill up your polystyrene container, and you need to be able to close the lid. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, the <laughs> that's like the $20. rule. It's like it's like a, a what do they call it? An honesty system. Yeah. And so when we came back to Australia, I was like, I want to recreate this for Australia uh, because we got a lot of people. Uh, you know, in Gumaranka, we're we're super rural. Uh, town is 800 people or so, and um, a lot of people here have never been overseas. And um, but we do have a really big yabby culture up here. We do have a lot of farms that actually grow yabbies as a way of diversified income. And uh, one of the people that, that works for us, um, her family has uh, literally has a yabby farm, and so they were uh, very kind enough to let us just come out and catch a. <laughs> we're not having way too many yabbies, by the way. Yeah. We're like way too many. We're I think we wanted 10 kilos, we ended up probably getting closer to 20. And uh, and yeah, we put a sort of pot on the fire and stuff like that, and it was pretty cool to be able to do it. We did like native ingredient stuff as well. And it uh, worked pretty well. It was well way too much, it was way too much. Yeah, and yeah. we weren't as good at the outdoor, we've learned a lot about outdoor cooking since, and we've also learned a lot more about our commercial. Because you don't realize how different it is when you cook food on a massive scale. Yeah, but we've massively had, different. We've had caterers in the building for weddings and stuff, and we're always asking them so questions. How, you, how, are you, how are you doing? Yeah, that? yeah. Um, how do you control heat, and how do you yeah get get your flavour balance right? Because you don't realise when you're cooking food on scale, like how much salt you're gonna need, and mm. how much extra flavour to add. Um, Scott Yaxley, uh, hi guys, good to see you. Uh, still going strong. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, there's not a winery in the country doing what you guys are doing. It's wonderful to see from Greg McGill. Thanks, Greg. Um, and and there isn't there. I mean, there's there's a few, and and we're we're really sort of hoping there'll be more because mm. I think it's really important for wineries to have before you. To, I'll pour you something in a second. I'll pour. Uh, I know you're keen, but I'm keen I to really see. Love I've got a little. It is an amazing wine, and we'll talk about the wine. We got, we got a lot of talking to do. We got a whole hour's worth of talking to do. Um, love what you guys are doing. Great wines and cool vibes. Thank you so much. Hi, Brennan and Laura. We're doing many Zoom sessions at the moment, but this is the most fun. Oh, Joe cool. Rogan or Gary Vaynerchuk? You're changing yes. the line. Oh, yeah, so cool. Gary Vaynerchuk, also someone who we used to. Yeah, seriously, Gary Vaynerchuk was yeah. the way that I got into wine. It's why I'm really passionate about what we're doing now because um, you know I got into wine. Well, I was working in wine. I was working at vintage cellars uh, and celebrations up in Queensland. Yeah. And, um, but the only sort of avenues that I had to learn from were like really terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only good ones were but I couldn't afford it. But I could afford to jump on the internet and surf YouTube. That was, I mean, I mean, it wasn't free, but it was relatively free. Um, and you could, uh, and and that was Gary, you know, taking yeah. a bunch of stuff. And, and they're was, all still on there. They're all still on there. Uh, Wine Library TV, seriously, one of the most amazing, uh, amazing online publications, and stops after about a thousand episodes. I'm going to see if I could go a thousand as well, uh, because I think I think a lot of the stuff could also be updated. You know, he stopped in 2008, I think that was you know yeah. ten years ago. So um, I think uh, you know, I think I think we could I think we could improve on it a little bit. Um, 
Totes agree about not worrying about looking stupid. I think that's one of the biggest learnings from my 30s. Trust yourself uh, and that you have value to it. Yes. I think just not giving a shit, I think, is is just a general rule I'm going to bring into my 30s. I mean, give a shit, but don't give a shit, if that if that makes any sense to anyone. <laughs> yeah, but it only works if you've got... You, need, you still need to have your own uh, sense of identity and um, self-assurance to be able to come from from that. Otherwise, you'll, yeah. you will keep doubting yourself. Like, you still need to have your own... Um, yeah, reason why, you know, and I guess standard that you hold yourself to. Um, what's up, Corey Ward on Insta? What's for dinner? Uh, what is for dinner? Well, I get you. Uh, I'm going to get you a drink because you need a drink. Uh, uh, <laughs> what is for dinner? What's for dinner? Yeah. What's for dinner? Uh, what's for dinner? Uh, I made a one pot Mexican burrito bowl today. One pot Mexican burrito bowl. Yeah. It's basically a gigantic burrito bowl. Oh, it was great. It was just so easy. Like you cut up the onion and capsicum, you know, fry the chicken all in a pot and then add the rice, the water, all the spices, beans, corn, everything. And then put it in the oven for 40 minutes. And then put cheese on top. So this, I don't, I'm not sure what we're going to call this. It actually looks really delicious. <laughs> it actually looks really delicious coming, out, really like delicious coming out. Um, for those who missed out, last night we decided to trial a match to see whether or not um, uh, what was it? We were looking at uh, the sausage sizzle, the classic Aussie sausage sizzle uh, with varying condiments, um, and we believe it's very that cold. a uh, a sparkling Shiraz, Shiraz, Syraz uh, would be the most applicable. So this is a Syrah that we've that Laura's mm -hmm. made, and we've uh, decided to to make it sparkling uh, via uh, soda siphon. And I was hoping that overnight. It would have absorbed more. Has it absorbed? Mm -mm. No, it still just wants to come out. It's just really cold and it feels really... Um, it just looks really weird. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. And I, it almost seems like staying in the canister has actually tainted the smell of the wine. I'm not sure if that's the canister or the wine. Oh, mm. don't be silly. I'm still going to send it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, awesome answer, thanks guys. Breno, it's from WA somewhere. Oh cool, Tempo from WA. Oh wicked. Yeah, uh, right. Temp Tempranillo is fantastic. I mean, a lot of, WA is probably one of the, the, the most underrated uh, wine, just, I mean, it's a big space. Uh, Ashley Ratcliffe, uh, watching you guys in front of the fireball with a Cooper Stout, yeah! Uh, yeah, and uh, nice weather for it. Can you tell Holly to come up and join me? I know she's tuned in. <laughs> yes, join your husband, Holly, Jesus. Uh, Bruno on the Forex Gold, yeah mate, I'm just getting prepped for our little uh, um, stint on here uh, where we're going to be bringing you up. I think I think maybe maybe Terry, you should come up on the 50th episode, 50, marking 50 days. Uh, Sue and Craig here at Sue's birthday going over the top tonight with a... Ooh, damn! Happy Man. birthday, Sue. Sue, we need a drink and together. Yeah. Another good one. Another good one. one. Just baller after baller. Vieri Castiglione Barolo 2015. Castiglione as well is like one of the more sort of elevated yeah. sites just as you come over the crest into Sedalunga. Um, you know, it's amazing sort of rockier site as opposed to Sedalunga's straight up clay. Um, and 2015, perhaps a little bit young, but I'm sure it's going to be looking delicious no matter what. Like that's one of those things like great wines, great sites. And that's the home of Vieri as well. Like that's the thing. It's like... If, if you're going to drink anything from Vieta, you drink the Castiglione because that's literally where the winery physically is. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah. They know Castiglione better home, than anyone else. Uh, home crew. Here's a question for you guys. We are in an ever-changing wine scene, for sure. Do you guys see yourself changing what you're doing each year in the winery? Is the market trends change or are you stuck to a specific philosophy of winemaking or grape growing? Or is the labels that evolve more, or is it the labels that evolve mm. more than the wine? Um, well, we could talk about funk works, I think, in this, because I think that's a really good good point to be made there about market trends. Um, yeah. It's it's funny because we are a uh, quite a trend-driven brand. Like, we project yeah. to be... Well, obviously, we need to be relevant to customers and we're always listening to what customers want, but um, in the background, we're almost actually fighting against that because one of the um, things that really impacts the wine industry, especially from agriculture, is this constantly replanting new varieties to suit what the market wants but that's actually it's not ecologically sustainable it's not financially sustainable for growers to continually replant and try and put in new yeah. varieties to keep up with the market so we're actually trying to stabilize that part yeah. of the market and then use winemaking techniques and philosophy to be able to produce what people want and then package it and deliver it in a way that is interesting and relevant yeah and exciting 
Yeah, so if you, um, if you, for example, like the, the, the winemaking methodology that we would like to adopt is, is what we would call the natural winemaking method methodology. And I understand that people that has a lot of people going, holy shit, you know, that I've never had a really great experience with natural wine before. And I totally appreciate that as well. Um, but I think there's a disparity between what, you know, um, most people know as natural wine because of its, you know, sheer popularity in the last maybe five years, as opposed to sort of what it truly is. Um, you know, that natural wine's definitely no excuse for shit wine, basically. Yeah. Like, shit wine is still shit wine, irrespective of how it's made. Um, but na if you reverse engineer the natural winemaking methodology going, okay, look, I want a, a great variety that I don't want to have to acid adjust, and I need it to mm -hmm. ferment safely, uh, like, in a wild manner, so it's going to have to be lower in alcohol with the right amount of acidity at the perfect amount of what we call phenolic ripeness during the ripening season. So that means we're going to need a pH of 3.2 to 3.8, which means nothing to you guys. I'm serious. It will probably means something to, mm. to a few of you, I'm sure, but it shouldn't mean anything to the daily drinker. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm, we're acutely aware of that. That's our job to worry about. It's going to have to be lower in alcohol at that right, so it's going to have to ripen, I guess, comparatively quicker, but it needs to start ripening a little bit later in the season so it doesn't get the early heat. So it needs to be a later bud burst, quick ripening variety, depending on where you are. So we've thought about all of that shit and actually gone back, as opposed to going, I want Pinot made naturally because Pinot sells. We've gone, no, we want to be making natural wine because that's how wine should be made in the long term. Mm and try to select a great variety in response to that. And indeed, Ashley Ratcliffe's chiming in right now, like he's the guy that basically kickstarted this. And again, he was kickstarting from a different perspective. Um, you know, it was less so about natural winemaking and actually probably more so about uh, uh, saving on natural resources and, and doing things a different way and disrupting the market. Um, two, 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 two different approaches exact same uh, uh, answer yeah, really at the end of the day and and very much congruent with each other um, and so we're, we've sort of taken that sort of I guess the marketing aspect of it is a completely different conversation like there's an ecological conversation here an artistic one and then there's the marketing side of things which is um, you know I I got into wine during the middle of the natural wine craze and really got into it obviously and um, but I found a lot of those wines were like 40 bucks, 50 bucks a bottle. And I was 19, 18 years old. Don't have that amount of money to spend on wine, I'm sorry. Um, but neither did my mates. And so they're still consuming heavily doctored wines. And then when they're discovering finally, when they have the disposable income to take a stab, take a shot at uh, what is now affectionately known as natty wines, um, they were being really, it was like a, a massive departure from what they were used to. And I thought it would be very interesting to see the exact opposite occur. If natural wine was at 20 bucks a bottle, then they discovered heavily doctored wine at 50, 60, 70 dollars a bottle, that sort of lactone rich, heavily soupy, acid adjusted sort of stuff. Um, then maybe there was going to be a disparity at that point where they were like, oh, I'm used to wine being really fun and refreshing and maybe slightly cloudy to something that's completely sterile and completely mm. sort of lean and uh, but then this sort of oaky soupiness, that real heavy, it's almost like drinking milk in comparison, uh, whether or not that would be really juxtaposing. Um, and so yeah, when we, we started, we, we were like, we weren't greedy. We were just like, we're just gonna, we're just gonna only ask 20 bucks for this. Uh, and I'm sure as uh, we learned very quickly, uh, the, the, the process of things like, you know, gross profits and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, taxation and employment and wage tax and all these other things. When you start to tackle them on, we probably <laughs> launched at the wrong price point, but it was right for the customer. I think that's, that's one thing that's been highlighted a few times. Like we think, we think about people, um, more so than we think about anything else. Um, and we try to service the need of people which we think people need, the market inherently needs to change to be able to warrant Australian Nebbiolo, Australian mm. Dolcetto or Nero or Fiano to actually be a legitimate thing. You know, if you go into a store, how many, how many uh, uh, Sauvignon blocks do you see from Australia? You know, Australia is not necessarily any, uh, they're, they're, don't get me wrong, there are places that are very much like the Loire, but I think we're overestimating. And where the vast bulk of Sauvignon Blanc actually comes from in Australia, yeah, it's nothing like the Loire. It's so the complete opposite. And so our sort of view, and that's why we call say one of our Nero's pipe dream, 
because the pipe dream is that Nero would outplant Sarah because we did the calculations. There is more, like unequivocally, there is more, and quantifiably so, mm. more great Nero sites in Australia than there are Sarah sites. And that is a mind boggling thing. We produced so much, produce so much Sarah, Shiraz in Australia yeah. of sites that simply climatically cannot handle it. And that, and that's climatically, not even talking about the soil, not even talking about the ecological side of things, just climatically yeah. is not suitable, but that's because the market demands it. And so if you can change the market, then you can change the, the agricultural product and you can inherently change an environment. So yeah, I mean, we, we dictate what, what we do based on what the land can do. But I mean, the, the marketing side of things operates um, uh, almost independently, I would say. Uh, and that's where, to, you know, and I know I'm spending a lot of time on this question because it's something that we speak at length about, um, Greg, because um, like we've started, so Laura, you've taken over production, mm. haven't you? Um, and to protect innovation and actually to keep up with the market or keep up with different, different strange things that no larger winery or even growing winery would entertain because every growing winery isn't interested in trying all the new shit it's interesting in scaling the current stuff. And I'm like, no, you, you can't do that because that's what got us into this this place, like in the first place. Like, as an industry. Yeah. As an industry is that we were like, oh, this works. Let's just do lots of that. And then, you know, like, so we created a sub brand within a brand. Um, uh, if you guys are familiar with business methodology um, in, um, uh, in aviation, there's something called a large company called Lockheed Martin and they established a company within a company to be able to do rapid innovation uh, with a bigger budget uh, called Skunk Works. And that's because they actually physically removed it. So I think Lockheed Martin must be based, I believe in Seattle where most yeah. aviation is based, but they put Skunk Works in like Texas next to a, 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 like a tire factory. And that's why they called it Skunk Works because it smelled like shit. Um, and so we started Funk Works uh, and I'm the head winemaker. Uh, <laughs> so that allows me to be able to be, and, and but we have restrictions uh, placed on us. It could be like two ton batches and max, you know, a handful of batches every year. And Laura gives me a mission, um, which is more aligned with what the company obviously wants to do. And that allows us to be able to entertain stylistic variants and, and, and very, in, you know, I'm fascinated with things like beer and wine, you know, smooshes. Uh, you know, that, that's a very innovative thing that has never really occurred in any other country. But there's, there's an array of other things that have occurred in other countries. That, ruh, 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 ruh. Um, things like Mistels and low alcohol, um, things mm. like uh, Piquette, Piquette, for example, yeah, this yeah, year yeah. Is, is something that's really interesting, interesting for us. Um, Soak the pot, hit it with a product called Barkeeper's Friend. I'm noting that for tomorrow. I'm going to be purchasing some Barkeeper's Friend. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to Google it. Um, Gamaraka, how is the giant rocking horse? Not too sure, haven't spent a lot of time up there, Sue. Um, but we have been told that we are the company that puts the rock in rocking horse. Um, <laughs> there's a great episode of Ugly, Ugly Delicious on Netflix all about crawfish. Yes! Native Aussie ingredients will be awesome. Yes! I agree with you. And that's one of the, the really cool things about sort of taking inspiration from other, other cuisines. There was a, a, um, a Jock on Frillo uh, restaurant here that did that did an amazing job with this, called Street Adelaide. Oh, Doesn't yes, exist anymore, yes. unfortunately, but um, was one of the most exciting restaurants that I'd actually been to, because they, they grabbed street foods from all around the world, but did native interpretations of them, it was insane. Um, who usually cooks in your household, unusually, Laura or Brennan, who's the better chef? Depends on the time of year. This is the who cooks yeah. in the house. Depends who's busier, I guess. You, you've yeah. cooked a lot last week. <laughs> yeah. You have. But last week yeah, prior, yeah, weeks Prior. Yeah, because you were, that's what happened. I'm, I'm you doing, were doing my, on your weekend. My yacht and Motolenghi escapade. Mm -hmm. um, Brendan, it's actually probably a reflection of just our characters in general. You sit on both extremes. Sometimes you get creative and it's a success, and sometimes you get creative. <laughs> it's really very much not. <laughs> like, you stomach it, and that, that's, that's only like, I'd say, 5% of the time of the total. Most of the time, it's very good. Yeah. Um, I tend to cook more healthier food. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, Yoda Modelenghi's been pretty good, I have to say. Yeah, like, like, been pretty good. There is a lot of, uh, like, cream cheese. There's a lot, yeah, of, there's a lot of just cheese, cheese in general. Uh, a lot of nuts. Nuts are pretty, pretty calorie-dense yeah. things. Flavor-dense as well. Um, but no, they like... I'm quite proud that we're pretty... Like, we share the cooking pretty... We actually share all the household work. Yeah, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. Um, yeah. Different personalities. 
I, th I think that goes without saying. Um, but we, yeah, I t typically see pretty much auto. We go through phases. So sometimes I'm, I'm just like spaced out and then Laura picks up the slack and then, I don't mm. know, it's come from working together for a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Like, we, we sort of, we don't really need to speak too much. Are you guys in relationships as well where you don't really need to speak too much? I mean, not hopefully, hopefully you do speak plenty. But, you know, where you just kind of, I don't know, you just kind of step in and pick up the slack and just do what needs to be done. And yeah, you know, I've like... read, I've heard someone, I've heard it described as a like it's a shared family brain. Like you have certain things that each of you will remember. It's like, like the Borg yeah, for Trekkies yeah. out there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but it's so that it's but it's it's a biological thing <laughs> yeah. so that you can function efficiently as a as a group of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're just we're just really really close. Um, uh, Terry, it's on like Donkey Kong 50th episode. Thousand episodes of liver transplant for Brendan and Terry. <laughs> Who cooks better, Laura or Brendan? Oh man! I'm gonna say Brendan. Rock at a hard place, man. Uh, Brendan, Thanks, you go. Brendan does cook. You cook fancier. I, yeah, Laura. Laura cooks the staples really well. I cook the really sort of crazy shit, like the technically. I find the technical challenge really, really <laughs> interesting. Um, and I've yeah, I've had a lot of fun with that. Smooth trench night, cafe Ah, cool. Um, because. If you will note, the quality of your music has increased quite dramatically. The fidelity of it. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's because we are listening to zero music here. <laughs> the veil has fallen. No, literally, we're listening to zero. We, we, I looked through just a lot of the, the sound that we've done for the last 30 days. And um, uh, it's actually streaming. Um, uh, 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 that was the other thing. We got contacted uh, by YouTube and a few other people that were like, hey, I, do you realize that you're actually um, playing music that you don't own? You know, oh, as, 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 as like a commercial brand thing. And I'm like, you know what, fair call. If someone was like using our brand to sell a shitload of their stuff, I'd be sort of like, mm. I'd be a little bit pissed off. Not that we're selling a shitload, but you know, you get what I mean. And so no, we decided to pivot a little bit, uh, change things up. We knew that we could improve your music. And I want feedback on the music because um, it is royalty free stuff. It is sort of moody stuff. And if you feel that like the mood's a little bit too, too light, you want some rock and stuff like that, we can cater for that as well. Um, trying to play within the, I guess, swim within the lanes that that, uh, that are afforded to us. Um, but uh, no, it is it is in that Cafe Del Mar sort of vibe. You're totally right. Uh, good rant. That was a that was a pretty good rant. It wasn't the. It was a good rant. I got concerned that we can't actually see if it's still playing, but no one flagged that the camera died or anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Uh, barkeeper's friend is amazing for some shower screens. I want I want to know what ah, the fuck this barkeeper's okay, friend bar thing is. Friend. Um, yo, yo, Sam Mitchell, thank you so much for chiming in. Uh, Street was so good. It was! Street was so good. Street was so good. Street was oh, unbelievably man, good. They had some of the best burgers. They had a, a, amazing burgers. I remember the vegetable pakora that they did. I remember the, um, the kangaroo, um, they did the kangaroo gnocchi. That was rice flour based gnocchi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah rice flour. And yeah. it was insane. Um, it was really good. It was like Love Scotty's noodles. freestyle. Where was Scotty in there? Hello, peeps. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jessica wasn't still playing Spotify. Uh, love the lo-fi beats. Thank you so much, Jess. Yeah, no, we had to we had to bit of, have a bit of a play with this thing. But um, I would like to know if we're talking business. This is Business Sundays. Mm. What are the most the biggest challenges that you've had in the last? What has it been? Seven, eight years? What are the, the three? You asked me a bunch of questions on my thirtieth. So I get to ask you these things. Three biggest yeah. challenges. What are the, what are the biggest challenges you've found? in starting your own business? Um, probably that you're... Uh, just, well, okay, firstly, there are so many ideas, and especially being around you, there are so many ideas always being generated. So there's so many, um, you know, and you know, there are opportunities, and you actually have to say no to something, because if you try and do everything, um, mm. you burn yourself out, you don't use resources efficiently and you don't do any of it well. So you actually really need to decide, you know, maximum of two or three projects and that's what you work on. Uh, so that's been a learning thing because we have, like we've overstretched multiple times um, as we've grown as well. And we've had to tailor that, I don't mean to interject, but um, you, like Laura, Laura is official, we have to, do you want, I was gonna give you some more. No. You want some? <laughs> okay. It just tastes really weird. Like the tannin and bubbles is 
But me out. Laura, Laura is our I, I, our CEO for one of a better way to call it is literally. It's not even a better way of describing it. Legitimately is, um, and that was that was agreed upon by you know even myself. Um, you know I, I'm I'm very aware of the creative energy that myself and the team, indeed, you know, the team that I look after generates, but we need the structure to be able to actually execute it. It's not about the idea. A squillion people can come up with a million ideas, seriously. Yeah. But no one can really execute them very well, and that's what we notice. So, you know, we have a Laura for that, to help organize these things. Yeah, you have to have both idea generation and then actual execution. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, the second thing is probably that you don't realize how much you're gonna have to like if you want to if you want to lead people and have people um, yeah like leading people is a give and take right you're obviously trying to create um, an atmosphere where they'll well, essentially do what the business needs but at the same time you also need to be willing to get feedback from them and if you want to improve as a leader and as a person and improve your business you actually have to be very open-minded and willing to listen to other people and that is that's hard because you actually have to address your own insecurities and your own um, your own roadblocks so yeah probably what you don't realize when you become a manager or a leader is that you actually have to look inwards a lot more than you expect and you have to actually address a lot of your own internal battles in order to be able to show up for the people that at the end of the day you're serving yes um, they're working for you but you're the one that they're looking to and you're guiding them and you need to try and take what you have to find potential in them yeah and that's hard yeah i like to think of it like because i'm a nerd mm. um that everyone wants to be luke skywalker when when you're a leader you're actually ben kenobi you're like you're Obi Wan Kenobi. You're trying to mm -hmm. you're you're trying to help your staff and your customers indeed mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. Luke Skywalker. You're trying to help them become like the they're, they're the main yeah. protagonist of this amazing story that is business. Uh, at the end of the day, um, and if they're they're failing at any point in time, like your job's to help them succeed, not not in my mind, not fire them or get rid of them or you know you want to. We try to have these terms in things like performance plans, for example, are very formal terms, but you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to actually just help them find success in, and in achieving things. Um, but I'm, a, I'm like a, I'm a workaholic, so I like to achieve things, so I just assume everyone's like me, so sometimes yeah. I guess some people don't want to achieve things. But yeah, that's, that's one of those things, isn't it? Being able to rejig your perspective. You are literally the boss, but. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a that that's a big sort of ego thing to, to be able to overcome. So that's two things. Yeah, that's What's two you? things. And the third thing is that uh, not every opinion matters. Mm -hmm. And if you and this is probably in reference more so to customers that people will, um, you know, we're putting all of our well, our ideas and our work, and especially when I first started, like when you make wine. You've spent four or five months with this with this baby, and you're so attached to it. And then it goes onto the market, and people, not everyone's going to like it. And it's not it's not actually about you. It's not about your business. It's just that it wasn't for that person. So yeah. you have to be able to distinguish. You have to be able to separate the feedback into what like what are things that I do need to take on board and action. What can I do differently next season when I'm making this wine again? Mm. What is it? Is that maybe that person just having a fucking bad day? Yeah, like, yeah. And that's all there is to it. Um, you can't measure irrationality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to be able to not get so attached to what you're doing. I think it was best put to me when someone said, um, like, if, uh, if there was a problem, like, you're flying a plane. And obviously, you know, my family working in aviation, um, they were like, you're flying a plane. Um, the captain comes over the, the PA and it's like, hey guys, we just thought we'd leave this to like an open vote. You know, where do you guys want to go? <laughs> right? It's like, how do you guys want to land the plane? Should I press this button or not? We're going to take like a majority vote. Um, the, fact of, <laughs> and the fact of the matter is um, that, that in that scenario, the people flying in the plane are the least qualified people to make that call. 
Um, and you would hope that the captain would never do that in the and first not all, place. But not all of those people on the plane will realise that. They'll no, be, no. yeah, yeah, I can do this. I, I got this, I got, this. I, got this. this, I know what we're doing, you know. I've read a book somewhere, I saw it in yeah. a movie. Um, you know, and so uh, that, that's one of those things of realising the qualification of the people that, are, especially if you're doing something artistic, you know, that's going to really, you know, the spectrum is so broad for art. You know, it's infinite yeah. uh, by, by definition. So, you know, you like how qualified is anyone based on you know based a comment there is the the commercial reality of something there's the scalability of something there's there's the actual like commercial business metrics relating to to a comment a, a surrounding an artistic movement yes you know but at the end of the day whether someone likes something or dislikes something is completely completely up to them and that's completely fair and that's one of the cool things about wine and the things are really we we need to try to delink this whole kind of concept of you know if you like this style of wine and don't like this style of wine then you are less a human being and it's the same sort of thing mm. with music it's like i actually we, we've sort of reached that point in the human race about music yeah, it's yeah. Like, i actually don't i really genuinely don't care what music you listen to because that's up to you why though we continually like to think that we care about what other people drink um, and, and have a status sort of layer based on that is, is very sort of foreign to me. Yeah. Um, well, and we, like, on that note, we stopped putting our wines into shows. Like, because we yeah, honestly stopped. never win anything. The most we get is, like, a bronze <laughs> yeah. or a silver. Yeah. And it used to really <laughs> irk me. And then I would be like, okay, what can I do different? All right, everyone, we're back. And just after we commented on how unqualified people try and make suggestions, I just said to <laughs> Brennan, "Isn't there something we can do about this?" Can't there, we? there is genuinely like, something we can, can do we about this. Can we get like a battery bank? Yeah, no, we've got. <laughs> no, there's totally, there's totally something we can get for this. All right, so we've got a new. Oh, oh, interesting. We're gonna, we're gonna be. Um, we're back. Uh, oh, but the tunes stay. But the tunes oh, stay. No, of course, the tunes will stay. The yeah. tunes will stay because they're like, yeah. Anyway. Um, guys, yeah, thank you for hanging around. Really funny. <laughs> I'm gonna be so obviously with this brand new camera, it's a much bigger sensor. That means that we get, you know, you guys get much higher depth. Uh, that means that the batteries drain quicker. Wombs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Right, blind wine. All right, blind wine. We're gonna, gonna make sure we do this because Terry Terry demands it. All right. So you're gonna you're gonna turn around. Yeah. You're gonna turn around. All right. All right. All right, what have we got here? I'm gonna give you, a, you a bit of a rinse so you get a, like a nice, and no, no, we're going black glass, black glass for you. Damn it. <laughs> so you can tell I'm, I'm very inexperienced. And I think what I might do is I might show, I'm gonna show everyone this. Oh, hello. If you can make that out. I will show it in the comments.
Fucking natural winemakers. No vintage, no variety. <laughs> Something like that. Um, all right, so uh, this is, uh, it's ready to go. <laughs> okay. Looks like a really interesting wine though. It does look like a really interesting wine. Ooh. <laughs> what are you thinking? I actually, I uh, like I love natural wine, but one of the things I struggle with is when uh, you can see the style more than the variety. Totally, I find variety really difficult. That's and I'm pretty sure I've spoken about this before, but it does this wine is going to be hard for that reason. Yeah, and that's one thing that I actually um, uh, and it was flagged with me by an amazing natural winemaker as well, Tim mm. Wildman. Mm. Uh, and we all have this inherent belief of being able to express sight, but it's so hard to pick the sight <laughs> based on based on how these wines are made, and and that is one of those sort of really difficult things. You know, uh, we've seen um, natural wine crop up a lot because you know we, we love mm -hmm. it as well. Really cool avant-garde punk movement, but we can't taste where the bloody wines come from because there is so much. In, you know, to, and, and his sort of adage was. To, to have like a you know really cool funky cloudy style of wine mm. um, when it comes to this is akin to Jacob's Creek heavily oaked Chardonnay um, you know yeah yeah this however is very delicious I mean and that's, well, the, and that's, that's the hard yeah, thing yeah. about natural wines is how delicious they yeah, genuinely are yeah because I was just are. thinking if I took this home like and, and drank it it, it wouldn't matter what variety or you drink it region like it's from. It's like, it's delicious, so does that actually matter? But this is the yeah. internal, because we're trained to identify this stuff, it doesn't fit with our, yeah. with our training and idea of what wine should be. For sure, for sure. All right, so uh, old world or new world? New world. Yes. Yes, new uh, world. It's some kind of high, it's like a high acid white. I don't think it's Chardonnay. I don't think it's Sauvignon Blanc, maybe. Pinot Gris, it's not Riesling. Cool. Uh, is it South Africa, New Zealand, or Australia? Australia. Is it South Australia, Victoria, and WA? Uh, I, I would love it to be Victorian. I think that would be really interesting, but I have a feeling it's South Australian. Okay. Is it Adelaide Hills, McLaren Vale, or Langhorne Creek? Adelaide Hills. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now it now all the way through. But so see, this, this there's is the thing. Like, so you know, all the natural yeah, wines come yeah. from Adelaide Hills in South Australia. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, all right, is it uh, Riesling, Shannon, or Chardonnay? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna be annoyed if it's Chardonnay. Okay. <laughs> cool story. <laughs> yeah, but you know my feelings about Chardonnay. Uh, it's Shannon. Is it Shannon? No, it's Chardonnay, isn't it? Oh, it's not. It is Riesling. It is Riesling. Ah. You're, yeah, you're on the right path. High yeah. acid white Riesling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just, I, yeah, I, I assume it tastes like it. I assumed it wasn't just because of Adelaide Hills, but that's really cool. Now, there wasn't a vintage stated on this. So no, do you have any, any, any idea on, on producer? I cannot think of who made So one of the natty, cr natty crowd. Riesling. Architects of Wine? Close. Oh. Good, 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 good stab though. He does do reasoning. Clear yeah, Valley, though, yeah, not Clare Adelaide Valley, Hills. Yeah. yeah. No. It is our old mate, Travis Townsend. Oh, Travis again. Wow. <laughs> it's just, I'm going to be annoyed if it's Chardonnay. Can you guys do a shirt or something with that? I'd like to buy it. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so this is The Joy uh, uh, by Travis Townsend, reasoning Adelaide Hills. I couldn't pick. There is no vintage. Yeah, and he's had that on a few of the wines. Yeah, uh, and, and, and whether or not that even matters, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, pretty cool little wine, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I, I enjoy I, like this. This I would. I, I'm not too sure. Does anyone know what the um, uh, retail on this? I'm late to the stream. Sorry. What kind of wine uh, are we drinking currently? Uh, Monster Matt 185 from Twitch. Um, we're drinking the Joy by Travis Townsend. 
Uh, this is a little natural wine from uh, Basket Range in Adelaide Hills. He's one of the, I guess, the, one of the, the main protagonists and largely has been historically uh, in Australia for natural wine. Um, and that is wine made uh, without additives of any kind from, uh, I, I believe, vineyards that are organically or biodynamically managed, managed. Or, yeah. or, or like or other, sustainably managed um, and largely made in, with artisanal methods. Um, Drink it like beer, perhaps that's why I enjoy it so much. I've really enjoyed the parallels between some natural wine and craft beers, particularly sours, of course. And mm. Sam, I totally agree with you. And that's where I kind of like, I, I, I love wine. It's not about fine wine, it's not about natural wine, it's not about craft wine, it's not even about commercial wine. You know, I, I might lambast uh, commercial wine quite often, but I love all wine. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still gonna, you know, I'm still going to go to the, the local RSL to, to meet up with my, my grandma and grandpa, etc., and still drink the, the the swill that they have have on, irrespective of whether it's from a big you know producer or you know. For though, if you're kind of chiming in from overseas, you probably have no idea what an RSL is, but you know, you should. It's amazing. Um, 180 bucks. A, 180 bucks a six pack. What's that divided by six? $30 a bottle. Wow, that's good. Yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sign me up. I'd, 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 I'd take that. That's good. This may be too big a question. 20 years, 50 years, or 200 years, do you think Australia would have an Appalachian control similar to the old world? You've got Firstly, three minutes. There is no question too big. It's about how long will the answer take? <laughs> your call on this one. You got no, three. No, no, no. No, I assumed it was going <laughs> your, your answer. You talk about this? Well, oh, of course, it has, has to be. This. There has to be. Like, appellation, appellation literally just means control. It really is just a control of what varieties, where, uh, and, and a set of rules. And the yeah, set of boundaries. rules is actually arbitrary. Um, and it does mean that you sacrifice um, individuality within a region, but maybe we won't appellate the variety. Maybe we won't appellate like France. Maybe we will mm. appellate... Um, that we will not use irrigation. And therefore, there will be a certain amount of variety. Like when you don't irrigate, for example, um, you like think about your own back garden. You can grow probably this much stuff there if you didn't irrigate in the first couple of years. But when you irrigate, you widen that gamut, don't you? You can actually start to, to you know, grow a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, so if you put that restriction in place, then suddenly we all know exactly what grows really well there without an, a, a greater draw on natural resources. So would that be a form of appellation, I guess? I think we will have to, be, as, as, and it seems like agriculturally, we've sort of already gone through all the throes of various things. We had a fertilizer shortage, so we found out think, ways to be able yeah. to not utilize fertilizer and look at cheaper ways to be able to use, utilize things like mulch. Everything's been about mo moisture retention. We've gone through market throes of of uh, changing dollar swings, and at the moment, of course, it favours export, um, and we're seeing the dramatic effects uh, of uh, you know on the environment just just in the last couple of years because of that. We've seen obviously more extreme droughts and more extreme bushfires. So yeah, yeah, totally. Like 2050, I'm going to say within the next five years, we're going to start to see some form of appellation somehow. It's definitely going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, and and would it be similar to the old world? I just, I don't think you're ever going to convince people to just commit to one flavour. Mm -hmm. I, I, and, and until such time as we're going to reconcile ourselves with a flavour is going to define our, our identity, I think that's going to be very, very difficult. A big, big, big thing for our culture to be able to, to consume, or obviously the Aussie culture um, to consume until such time as we've actually even identified with our own identity and that's that's the hardest thing at the moment we have a massive mm. identity crisis in Australia probably the worst in the world I, I would argue um, and so we got to get over that first then we can get to being champions of our own flavors and that could be in my opinion would be probably high acid reds definitely high acid whites and textural whites um, and, and, and keep in mind Australia is a very big country as well so it's not all going to be the same it's definitely going to be different. Uh, we are a huge country. We like like words can't describe how big we are as a country. There are very few countries the size of us in the world. Um, and to say that we all grow Shiraz very well is very much folly. Very much folly. That's the same thing goes for whiskey as well. To say that whiskey matured in cans and whiskey matured in say you know Tasmania is is should be subject to the same rules, which is in Australia two years in wood, is folly. Um, it would mean that you probably wouldn't want to be maturing whiskey in cans. 
um, that would be a, a, a pretty silly move. Um, but you probably would want to do it in Tasmania. So it really starts to restrict the places based on a, an artificial rule. So there should be different rules for different places, a little bit like, you know, the Appalachians in the Rhone Valley and the Appalachians in, in Burgundy or Bordeaux or, you know, across Italy, across Spain. You know, they, they really segment uh, places that are only hundreds of kilometers apart, you know, or yeah, even less. Yeah, and different grades of Appalachian as well. Different grades, yeah, different grades yeah. uh, therein. It would um, start with a voluntary adoption of some kind of um, certification. So probably the closest thing is McLaren Vale had Ent wine, so ENT wine yeah. um, is what started, and now that's evolved into sustainable wine growing. And that's both a certification for vineyards and also for a winery. And it's not it's not related to natural wine, it's not related to um, organics, but it's kind of, it's a, it's a starting point for um, ethical production practices that is audited. Yeah. Um, and that is a good start. And on that note, and I should acknowledge Terry, is it just me or is it the same song on repeat? I don't know. I'm <laughs> well, going to go back to through it. and listen to it. I'm going to try to make sure that it's not on the next track. <laughs> I actually have five different songs on there that all should not be on repeat uh, at all. Um, uh, and if, that's, <laughs> if that is indeed the case, I'm very sorry. And I'm, I'm going to assume that I've checked or not checked the wrong or incorrect <laughs> box. Uh, we're going to use sorry, your call is important to us all. Right, <laughs> <laughs> so amazing wise will be with Jolly. Thank you for your patience. That would actually be quite funny if that was our if that was our customer service. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely not. No, that is all Amanda. Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you send in a message like that, I assure you that's Amanda. Uh, but guys, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you very so much for obviously all your support. Uh, thank you. I hope you've had an amazing weekend, uh, as as I certainly have. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow at the um, at the exact same time at 5 p.m. Adelaide time, 5:30 if you're on the eastern coast, and a very irrelevant time if you're on the west coast. Um, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great night. <laughs>